Let us pray. God of mercy, you promise never to break your covenant with us amid all the changing words of our generation. Speak your eternal word that does not change. Then, may we respond to your gracious promises with faithful and obedient lives. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Our first reading is from Hosea, chapter one, verse two through 10. The Lord said, Hosea, Israel has betrayed me like an unfaithful wife. Marry such a woman and have children by her. So I married Gomer, the daughter of Dibliam, and we had a son. Then the Lord said, Hosea, name your son Jezreel because I will soon punish the descendants of King Jehu of Israel for the murders he committed in Jezreel Valley. I will destroy his kingdom, and in Jezreel Valley, I will break the power of Israel. Later, Gomer had a daughter, and the Lord said, name her lo Rahama, because I will no longer have mercy and forgive Israel, but I am the Lord God of Judah and I will have mercy and save Judah by my own power, not by wars and arrows or swords and cavalry. After Gomer had stopped nursing lo Rahama, she had another son. Then the Lord said, Name him lo am I, because these people are not mine, and I am not their God. Someday I, it will be impossible to count the people of Israel because there will be as many of them as there are grains of sand along the seashore. They are now called not my people, but in the future they will be called children of the living God. Our next reading is from Psalm 85. Lord, you were, favor you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You pardoned all their sin. You withdrew all your worth. You turned from your hot anger and put away your indignation towards us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again so that your people may rejoice in you? Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground, and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him, and will make a path for his steps. Today's Gospel reading is from Luke chapter 11, verse 1 through 13. Jesus was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us and do not bring us to the time of trial. And he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend and you go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves of bread for a friend of mine has arrived and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, do not bother me. The door has already been locked. My children are in bed, are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given you. 
Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks, receives, and everyone who searches, finds, and for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The word of the Lord. Good morning, Lakeside friends. I told Chris this week, it feels like a homecoming to be back with you. Thank you so much for welcoming me back. And I also want to say thank you for everything, for the past year and for your friendship and support that I still feel today, and I know I will continue to feel. Thank you. Prophetic writings like Hosea are tough. Not only do they have some really hard to pronounce words, which Sophie did a, an amazing job reading, they are filled with metaphors and double meanings, many of which don't necessarily mean the same thing in our time as they did in Hosea's time. Prophetic writings are meant to communicate and illuminate, but they are also meant to shock, startle, and confuse. Hosea, job well done. Hosea, as God's prophet, accused Israel of being unfaithful to their covenant with God. Unfaithful politically, religiously, sexually, socially, to such a degree that their unfaithfulness even affects the land itself. Chapter 4 says, Therefore the land mourns, and all who live in it languish, together with the wild animals and the birds of the air, even the fish are perishing. What is worse, they don't even seem to realize it. In chapter 7, we read Ephraim, which is a synonym for Israel here. Ephraim, he is rotting away. Ephraim is like a cake, incapable of turning. Strangers have consumed his strength, but he has taken no notice. I once read that Israel's prophets spoke for God to move the people toward God from whatever condition they were in. When they were in exile, feeling hopeless, the prophets spoke words of comfort and hope. But if they were complacent, oblivious to the plight of those around them, the prophets spoke words of judgment. Both words of hope and judgment were meant to call the people back to life with God. Hosea, in his words and in his life, challenges Israel to remember and fulfill its covenant relationship with God. Our Book of Order says that human beings have no higher goal in life than to glorify and enjoy God now and forever, living in covenant fellowship with God and participating in God's mission. Hosea startles us into asking, what does that mean? What does it mean to live in covenant fellowship with God? In the world of the biblical writers, a covenant was simply an agreement or a pact or a treaty. They included both promises and obligations for both parties. You'll recall that the Old Testament describes the relationship between God and Israel through the metaphor of covenant many times. God makes a covenant with Noah, with Abraham, with Israel at Mount Sinai, with David. Leviticus says, And I will walk among you and will be your God, and you shall be my people. That is a covenant. When Israel violates the covenant with God, biblical scholars Lim and Castello point out that God could either end the relationship or provide a way forward. The thing is, they say, God doesn't have to but God always chooses option B. God will not let go of Israel. So what is this God like? 
the one in Hosea, the one who will not let go of Israel. What kind of covenant partner is God? One of the things that I love about the book of Hosea is its earthiness, its raw, bare emotion. It is filled with passion, longing, sadness, anger, betrayal, and love. And all of those emotions are attributed to God. Grumpy. I'm going to add grumpy to that list, too. Hosea is commanded to marry an unfaithful wife and have children with her. His family is a demonstration of broken covenant. His feelings represent God's feelings. In our passage today, we hear God's anger and sense of betrayal. The children's names symbolize a reversal of covenantal promises. In the New Revised Standard, those names are not pitied and not my people. But immediately after we hear, you are not my people and I am not your God, we also hear God's longing and determination for a future. The very next word in the New Revised Standard is yet. Yet the number of the people of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which can be neither measured nor numbered. Where it was said, you are not my people, it shall be said to them, children of the living God. God will not let go of Israel. I want to pause here for just a moment, and I want you to take in that image of God presented in Hosea. How does it feel to think about God being that passionate about the church, about you? Can you imagine God longing for you, refusing to let you go? Can you imagine God suffering with a feeling of love and commitment that is unrequited? This may be an exciting image for some of us, but it also may be a startling one. Hosea says the God who makes a covenant with us is passionate, determined, committed. This picture of God might startle us to ask, what kind of covenant partner are we? Our gospel lesson today includes Luke's version of the Lord's Prayer, a prayer that we pray every Sunday together. But how do we pray it? Are we passionately reaching out to our covenant partner? Jesus goes on to tell a story about a really annoying friend who goes to their friend's home at midnight to ask for bread to share with his company. How rude, can you imagine? But Jesus says, yes, friend one, persist. Go to friend two's home, ask, seek, knock, your friend will get up and come to the door precisely because you are friends. The word translated persistence in my dictionary is also translated shamelessness. It has the sense of lack of sensitivity to what is proper, careless about the good opinion of others, ignoring convention. When I read that definition, what immediately came to mind for me was the story that's been in the news lately about the WNBA players from the New York Liberty and the Indiana Fever who were fined for wearing Black Lives Matter t-shirts during their warm-ups. And later, uh, during press conferences, they refused to answer questions about basketball. Uh, they would only talk about their protest and their advocacy for Black Lives Matter. How impolite to make us uncomfortable with their shameless persistence, with their ignoring proper sports and media conventions. But it kind of sounds like Hosea. Marry an unfaithful wife and have children with her? Shocking. It sounds like us when we dare to ask God to bring about God's kingdom, to forgive us, 
to give us what we need each day. So bold. It also kind of sounds like God shamelessly doing whatever God needs to do to woo us back to covenant intimacy. If we are to be passionate covenant partners, Hosea might be able to help us. We might need to face the truth about the ways in which we have not been passionate, the ways that we have been complacent or oblivious, like that cake incapable of turning. Now, we'll each have our own truths to face. The church has its own truths that we have to face together. But I'll tell you what came to mind for me when I thought about this. I thought about all the ways, without my even realizing it, without my even knowing that that's what was happening, that my ways of speaking and dressing and so many other things as a white person in America are the privileged ways of doing things, assumed to be the proper norm, making anything outside that norm somehow less wrong, rude, thuggish, or worse. Shamelessly bold covenant partners know God. They develop intimacy with God. Willis Jenkins says that Hosea's modeling of God's experience invites the people into a matching kind of love. Hosea's major indictment of Israel is that they do not know God, and he urges, let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. God's covenant partners will persist, will ask, seek, knock, and grow toward intimate knowledge of God. Passionate covenant partners are right to be shocked by the shame and what we might even call abuse that Gomer and her children suffer later in this text. Taking the betrayed spouse metaphor too far, applying Hosea too literally, especially as a representative of God, can and has resulted in the justification of abuse toward women and children. Let's be startled into wondering about the gomers of our world, those with no voice who are defined by the judgments of others. Let's ask, who are those in our world who feel as if they are named not pitied or not my people? Let's remember that God hears their voice and will not let them go. Those in covenant fellowship with God live in hope, and in our world, that in itself can be a shameless, bold thing. When we feel as if there seems to be no way forward to a healed and reconciled world, Lim and Castello tell us that our hope is in a God-enabled and God-promised possibility, one hinging on God's covenant bond. They encourage us to live in a state of covenant conditionedness, which is a place where God's grounding, shameless, bold, persistent reality, and our responsive, shameless, bold, persistent obedience meet and interact. When we're tempted to give up hope, I like to remember the words of Rabbi Irving Greenberg, who says that covenant is a process. Perfection may take longer, but it will only come in a partnership, a covenant of humans and God. In a bit, we are going to pray together the Lord's Prayer. As we do, listen. Hear the audacious things you are asking. Pray it with shamelessness. Pray it with hope. Pray it as a covenant partner trusting that God will not let you go. Thanks be to God for not letting us go. May God give us the courage to do the same. Amen.
Please be seated.